these criticisms, I think, at least in retrospect, are not too terribly controversial. Um, uh, in, in, once you sort of start to draw attention to them, uh, the, again, it's not hard for uh, for you know, men to start noticing them. Again, women have been noticing these things for a very long time, of course, um, and it's it's taken men some time to catch up. Uh, the philosopher Sandra Harding labels these spontaneous feminist empiricism. Uh, these are sort of examples of, of, of where you look at sort of specific findings that men might have overlooked um, on empirical grounds, uh, but women, by contrast, have sort of recognized these things very, very clearly, very automatically, if you will. Now, uh, it's, if you will, this is a criticism of scientific practice, again, of the history of various of certain disciplines, rather than something that sort of criticizes science on principle. Uh, a different perspective comes from philosophical feminist empiricism, is the phrase Harding uses, uh, which focuses on sort of trying to improve our basic concepts of science, what science means, how it works, by drawing on sort of the deliberately fem feminist perspectives. And, and this sort of, you know, you can sort of go back and take a look at Popper from a feminist lens, for example, or Kuhn from a feminist lens and you can sort of try to say okay uh, you know given what we understand about Popper what's what can we sort of see uh, um, that we might have missed if we're looking at science through a Popperian but also through a feminist lens or through a Kuhnian feminist lens um, and it, it sort of it, it sort of remain tries to sort of remain true to these sorts of sort of broad empiricist traditions without sort of undercutting sort of in, in any sort of deep way um, what the function of science is um, uh, I want to sort of, I mentioned this in passing, but I want to sort of leave it aside to focus instead on a third category that uh, 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 Harding draws our attention to, something she calls radical feminist epistemology, which has sort of two main approaches. Uh, first off, what she calls feminist postmodernism, which obviously ties into to postmodernism, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about later on. Um, and it, this is an approach which is generally relativistic. Uh, it tends to reject the idea that there is any sort of single true account of the world, uh, that science offers us one perspective, but it's only one perspective among many. There's other perspectives, again, for example, perhaps sort of ancient tribal perspectives, which also provide a certain kind of truth, um, which are, is not to be sort of viewed as necessarily inferior to a scientific perspective. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of what we're talking about here, the idea that there might be a female perspective, which is, might be fundamentally different and possibly even incompatible with a male perspective. But according to feminist postmodernism, we should not view either of these perspectives as fundamentally superior to one another. And then the other uh, uh, main approach to radical feminist epistemology is something called standpoint epistemology. Standpoint epistemology says that there are certain facts about the world which are only knowable from a particular point of view. You might know things, for example, if you are uh, raised in an aristocratic context, you might understand things about the world which are just fundamentally and radically different than if you're raised in a, 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 a working class uh, a perspective. People working in feminist epistemology and standpoint epistemology often are particularly interested in the point perspectives of oppressed peoples uh, because the people in power usually have no difficulty ha getting their voices heard. They're the ones who, for example, can write books and can publish books and can command the attention of the press and other intellectuals. The perspectives of powerful people is not at all hard to understand because they tend to be the dominant perspectives in any given culture. But oppressed peoples are often, by their very nature, neglected and marginalized. So, um, uh, in the interest of trying to sort of turn the tables on the dominant narrative, but standpoint epistemology tries to sort of make the case that oppressed people's knowledge are, is fundamentally superior to those of people in power, precisely because they see things that powerful people are incapable of seeing. Now, it's suffice to say, standpoint epistemology and radical feminist epistemology are pretty controversial. Um, you know, I do think there is a certain sort of roguish and nonconformist appeal to these radical approaches. Um, it, it, it is, I think, important to, to not simply accept dominant narratives, and, and, that it, 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 and feminist epistemology sort of reminds us uh, that we can often sort of get hypnotized to one particular point of view. Um, but I also think it's fair to say that sort of by their very nature, standpoint epistemology often Often only resonates with people who are already converted to it. If it's the case that certain facts might be only appreciable from a certain perspective, then perhaps it might be again the virtues and the value of standpoint epistemology might actually be among the things that you can only appreciate if you're already viewing things from the point of view of standpoint epistemology. 
Um, now, it, it, it's it's hard, not hard, I think, to sort of see the idea that there, there's going to be a problem with the claim that marginalized people are always, always going to have superior insight, that they're going to understand things about the world and about life uh, that empowered people don't understand. Now, again, I, I have no difficulty accepting the idea that there's going to be some facts that, for example, people of color can appreciate about the politics of race that white people might not be able to understand, that people who are in uh, oppressed religious groups might be able to understand uh, the nature of uh, religious studies better uh, uh, than people who are in more dominant religious groups. Uh, so certainly, again, it's if, if we take sort of the more modest claims of standpoint epistemology, I don't have too much difficulty with it. But the idea that in any and all cases, marginalized people is going to have a, a superior point of view, it just it seems to stretch plausibility. There's going to be some some things that people in empowered groups are going to understand better uh, than people in disempowered groups, not because the people in the empowered groups are somehow superior to them, but simply because they're going to have access and exposure to things that people in disempowered groups are not going to have. And that's exactly the same reason why people in disempowered groups are going to appreciate and understand some things better than people in empowered groups. Now, even in as much as there are perspectival differences, it's not entirely clear to me, at least, what kind of practical effect these things are going to have on science. Again, perhaps in certain sort of particular areas of science, uh, okay, I can get on board with that. But the idea that science as a fundamental discipline needs to sort of be reanalyzed and re-sort of constituted from the ground up to account for, for radical feminist perspectives uh, is something that, uh, to me, seems to sort of be pushing things a little bit too far. And I think the testimony to this perhaps is the, in the fact that many of the uh, most important female scientists uh, in sort of modern times have explicitly rejected radical feminist epistemology um, and many of these female scientists actually are viewed as heroes by these uh, very feminist philosophers. Uh, so uh, again, this is not to sort of to dismiss radical feminist epistemology out of hand. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is not to say that it isn't worth studying. It absolutely is. Um, uh, but I do think that you know we we want to recognize that it doesn't get the label radical for nothing. A anything that sort of is adopting a radical label is going to be inviting heightened scrutiny, and and, and I think for for good reason. Okay, uh, I want to sort of shift gears a little bit now from sort of explicitly feminist perspectives to, to, to a sort of related set of perspectives. Heretofore in this course, we've been looking principally, of course, at philosophy and history of science. We had, a, a, again, a, a, a one lecture on the sociology of science, and, and heretofore we've been looking now at sort of feminist perspectives on science. But these are not the only fields that have, in the last few decades, come to pay close attention to the nature of science. Anthropology has looked in important ways at the nature of science, uh, so has economics, uh, um, so has literary criticism. So has psychology, um, and they've all they've all you know made some interesting and worthwhile observations about the nature of science um, uh, that are worth paying at least some attention to. Um, now, uh, w these boundaries sort of start to get sort of uh, uh, broken down in a lot of ways. The relationship between anthropology and economics starts to become blurry. In the same way, I suggest the relationship between sociology and philosophy is kind of blurry, um, and uh, the, the result comes that you get this sort of uh, hodgepodge, which sort of collectively comes to be referred to as science studies. In the 90s, science studies was sort of a very, very big thing, and there was a lot of sort of interdisciplinary work that was resulted, and in, in many ways it was chaotic. Uh, it was uh, sort of hard to sort of process, but precisely because it wasn't sure exactly sort of who was best qualified to engage in, for example, peer review over the various different uh, uh, kinds of papers and journals that were being produced. And a lot of uh, the most prominent voices in this period have come to be associated with this umbrella term of postmodernism. Now, I've sort of touched very, very briefly on postmodern perspectives at se several different points in these lectures, um, but I want to say a little bit now more ex explicitly about what postmodernism is. I put is in scare quotes there for, it's a bit of an inside joke if you have an understanding, I'm not going to unpack it. But let me say a little bit now about, again, about postmodernism, what it is, uh, um, uh, and why, why it's interesting, and why it's problematic. Uh, originally, the term postmodernism referred to a particular style of architecture, uh, but it actually gradually m migrated into philosophy and perhaps most notoriously literary criticism. Uh, now, obviously, it's reacting to the notion of modernism, which is sort of generally speaking considered to be another term for the Enlightenment. So I opened this lecture up by talking about how the Enlightenment view comes to be criticized. Uh, so if, uh, you know, if we're going to 
sort of start thinking about postmodernism, one simple way of understanding it is as an attempt to make sense of the failure of that optimistic, rationalistic project of the Enlightenment to, to sort of make sense of everything. And of course, one big theme in this context is the theme of relativism. Now, uh, one famous phrase in, in, in the context of, of, of postmodernism is the idea that we, we need to reject all what are called meta-narratives. That is to say, narratives that try to make sense of everything. All different theories, all different ideas, all different perspectives. You know, Marxism, for example, is a meta-narrative that tries to account for everything under the auspices of one sort of grand unified theory of, of social science. Um, Freudianism would be another meta-narrative. Uh, Christianity would be another meta narrative you know these 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 sort of overarching stories that try to make sense of all of reality in some sort of grand sweeping gesture postmodernism as a rule says that there is no such meta narrative that can make sense of everything all that there are are sort of a host of conflicting different perspectives and ideas that take a look at this part of the world or that part of the world and these different perspectives are not always compatible now, a lot of interesting work followed out of uh, the postmodern tradition, um, but of course, so has also an awful lot of confusion. Uh, again, I don't think I'm talking at a school when I say that a lot of people walk away from reading the postmodernist people, for example, like Jacques Derrida, uh, by thinking and, uh, and that there's something, some kind of grand joke being played here. Um, that's uh, that there, that there, there's just some sort of grand intellectual pretension uh, that, that that maybe the postmodern are just to, to, to adopt the British phrase, just taking the piss. Uh, they're just sort of leading us by a nose in a rational way, if I can steal that phrase from Fire Robin. Uh, now, again, I'm not meaning to suggest that that's all that's going on in postmodernism. Again, like I say, I actually do think that there is a fair amount of scholarship here, which is worth attending to. Um, but it's, it can be very difficult to sort the wheat from the chaff. Uh, I, I, I get the distinct impression that a lot of postmodernists are just in it for the lulls, so to speak. Now, um, the postmodernists made a long sort of sustained critique of science as such. Uh, and it's worth noting, again, that that sort of I think the postmodern approach to science is rejected by a tremendous amount of people who actually study science, including philosophers um, again, most feminist cr uh, critics of science, most sociologists of science um, uh, in a lot of ways, because, again, it, there's sort of an, an irony at the heart of it in the same way that postmodernism rejects meta narratives. It sort of ends up being sort of a meta narrative unto itself. It takes a sort of one size fits all approach. It says that that science is just is fundamentally no different than literary criticism. They're, they're they're both just ways of analyzing texts. You know, literary criticism looks at you know Herman Melville for example and tries to analyze the text uh, 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 that, that Melville wrote. And s physics looks at the text of uh, you know Isaac Newton and and all these other scientists tries to analyze nature as a text. Um, and, and and an awful lot of the writings are just horribly painfully obscure. Now, again, in their defense, uh, they're trying to make sense of some complicated things, so it does make sense that they are going to be tr coming up with obscure language. I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, the, the postmodernist writings are obscure, but hey, so, is, so are a lot of, you know, sort of technical physics journals that get very, very obscure. Genetics writings can get very, very obscure. So something being horribly obscure is, doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong or that it's bad. But after several decades of sort of postmodernist attacks on science, I, I think sort of th there started to become a concerted effort on behalf of pro-science forces to strike back. And this has come in the context of again, sometimes scientists, sometimes philosophers of science, um, sometimes sort of science journalists or science popularizers. And what ensued in the in the the the, the 90s was a, a sort of a general public debate uh, that comes to be referred to as the science wars. Now, again, on the one hand, the postmodernists made the argument that scientists were sort of fundamentally naive. They thought they had the keys to the kingdom, that they were looking into reality and seeing things the way they truly were and describing the fundamental nature of reality when, in, when the, in fact, that's exactly what the Christians thought that they were doing. Uh, you know, that's exactly what Marx thought he was doing, what Freud thought he was doing. They all thought that they had it all figured out and they were all wrong and the postmodernists wanted to deflate these pretensions of the scientists. Um, and sort of and, and, and returning the favor, scientists thought that postmodernists 
just didn't understand what science actually was. They didn't actually bother to get science educations. Uh, they had this sort of outside perspective, and they thought that they were seeing into the heart of science itself, when in fact they were uh, uh, imposing on it this very sort of jaundiced view um, that blinded them to the very real advantages and uh, uh, benefits that science can actually produce. And of course, there's also a sociological charge that the postmodernists were just jealous of science, that you know, a lot of money was funneled into science, a lot of respect, a lot of authority, and, well, uh, postmodernists wanted a, a piece of that. So they decided to try to take science down a peg, not for sort of fair, critical, uh, fair-minded reasons, uh, but out of these sort of, you know, sort of more petty emotions, uh, like envy and jealousy. Now, the science wars probably reached its apogee with the infamous Sokol hoax, uh, which happened when the physicist Alan Sokol decided to beat the postmodernists at their own game. Uh, he, he spent some time sort of reading and studying postmodern scholarship and tried to sort of get the rhythms and the language and the vernacular that postmodernists like to use. And he used this sort of study to, to write a paper which he titled uh, Transgressing the Boundaries Towards Transformation formative hermeneutics of quantum gravity. Now, if that sounds like utter balderdash to you, congratulations, that's exactly what Sokol meant it to be. It, the whole paper is every bit as nonsensical as that title suggests. Those are all sort of buzzwords that are often found both in sort of fields of science and also in fields uh, of, of postmodernist literary criticism. Um, and he submitted this paper to a, a, you know, a quote-unquote respectable postmodern journal, and the editors didn't seem to realize that they were being trolled. Um, all they heard was this highly respected physicist was wanting to publish in their journal that, that he that he that looked like scientists were si finally coming around to their point of view, and they got so excited by this that they published the article, um, and Sokol uh, then, uh, again, on the same day that his article got published in this journal, he, Sokol published another article in another journal, confessing the whole thing was a sham and trying to expose the postmodernists as charlatans that had absolutely no intellectual rigor or standards. There was, again, no intellectual merit at all to his paper, but that didn't matter. Uh, they published it because they wanted the win. Now, the editors of the journal, of course, turned around and uh, accused Sokol of taking advantage of them, of being fundamentally deceptive and dishonest. Um, and you know, there was a pr fairly protracted exchange between the two of them. Um, but, you know, again, I'll let you be the judge as to whether or not Sokol was fair. I want to play a little game here called Spot the Hoax. I'm going to present to you two different quotes. I'm going to read them both at length. One of them comes from the Sokol paper, and another one comes from a or what's considered to be a classic of postmodern scholarship. So here is your first quote. Differential topology has traditionally privileged the study of what are known technically as manifolds without boundary. However, in the past decade, under the impetus of the feminist critique, some mathematicians have given renewed attention to the theory of, quote, manifolds without boundary. Manifold, excuse me, manifolds with boundary. Perhaps not coincidentally, it is precisely these manifolds that arise in the new physics of superstring theory. That's quote one. Here's quote two. The Einsteinian constant is not a constant. It is not a center. It is the very concept of variability. It is, finally, the concept of the game. In other words, it is not the concept of something, of a center, of a starting point from which an observer could master the field, but the very concept of the game. There are whole websites out there uh, that are dedicated to what are called postmodern essay generators. You just you visit them, and they will generate utter gibberish, which sounds good. It sounds like it has the the right words and the right grammatical structures to be critical, but in fact they're just nonsense. Now I'm not going to tell you which of these is the hoax and which of these is the real article. If you really want to know, you can Google these things, uh, both of these expressions for yourself. Um, but suffice to say, if it's not immediately obvious to you which is which, that suggests that there's sort of something problematic about po a lot of postmodern scholarship. Now, what is the upshot of the Sokol hoax? Well, 
after the Sokol hoax, I think popular opinion turned against postmodernism in a lot of ways, and an awful lot of parody and ridicule ensued. Uh, now, I think in, many, in some ways this is amusing and entertaining, but in other ways it actually is kind of disappointing and sad, because both sides of this debate actually oftentimes do get kind of full of themselves, and they, 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 they arrogantly dismiss some legitimate claims from, from the other side. Both sides, both postmodernism and science, produce important insights and important thinking about the nature of reality, about the nature of human nature, about hu hu the limitations of human perspectives on the world. Um, and these are things which, frankly, if, if we sort of, I think, took a more open-minded approach and a more humble approach to our preferred perspectives, we could learn a lot from. Postmodernists, I think, are wrong to simply dismiss science as just one other form of literary criticism, as just one way of reading a text. But by the same token, I think scientists are kind of unfair in their dismissing of postmodernist perspectives and, and, and the assumption that they can just sort of read nature off the data. They can just carve nature at the joints, as it were, um, and they just follow the evidence where it leads. Um, this is something which, again, I, I, I think it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a simply a myth that that's how science works, that there is some sort of pure access to evidence, some sort of direct access to reality. It doesn't work that way. And postmodern I think can help us recognize this if we can at least try to parse through their incomprehensible verbiage. Now, that's simply by way of saying that postmodernism is, I think, an overreaction to a legitimate set of problems. Now, from my perspective, I think these problems are better articulated by people like Thomas Kuhn and Paul Feyerabend than by a lot of sort of postmodernist thinkers, a lot of continental thinkers themselves. But no doubt that's because of my particular perspective and training in, in Western analytic philosophy. I think that postmodernism can serve this same function, too, if you are patient with it, if you actually try try to sort of see the merit, if you, if you go out of your way to try to sort of give it the benefit of the doubt. The obscurantism that falls out of a lot of postmodernist scholarship, I think, does it no favors. I think that uh, again, the, the, the best work in postmodernism actually tries to be accessible. And those of us, again, like me, who really want to tr do their best to sort of see value in as much scholarship as they can, to sort of understand um, that even fundamentally flawed perspectives might actually help uh, shed some light on things, even if uh, it's done so in a roundabout and indirect way, um, and this, this goes for science, it goes for anything else, um, it, it is to say that we should perhaps get down off our high horses and not simply assume that our perspective has everything figured out. That goes for science, that goes for philosophy, uh, that goes for, for feminist perspectives, as it goes for postmodernist perspectives.